Hey, good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I'm Ken Walls and I'm your host. And today I have the one and only Mr. James Barber on the show, the Phantom of the Opera, among a lot of other amazing things this guy has done. So make sure you share this out and stay with us. Be right back. And we're back. Let me bring James on. Mr. Barber, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I want that intro. I'm like, da 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 <laughs> I spent a lot of money having that intro made. Um, so, dude, thank you for being here. And, yeah. and, and, you know, just so the audience knows, you and I are friends. And um, so I'm allowed to call you dude. Everybody else has to call you Mr. Barber. Mr. Dude. <laughs> Mr. Dude. <laughs> Dr. Dude. Dr. Dude. Oh, man. So um, I first met you at Grant Cardone's very first 10X Growth Conference in Miami. And um, I remember seeing that there was this 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 singer dude on, on the... Uh, on the on the agenda and i was like what what a singer what what i, I thought this was a motivational conference what's this all about yeah. and holy crap did you light it up man it oh, was thanks bro it, it was incredible thanks. and i and from that point forward i was like i'm just gonna be a fanboy and follow this dude wherever he goes so ah, you're kind yeah so so hey talk about Talk about where, let's start with where you were born and raised, man. Yeah, I was born in uh, the South, way down South in Southern New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> I was born in Cherry, well, I was born in Mount Holly, New Jersey, but I, I we moved to Cherry Hill when I was like two. Uh, born in Mount Holly, but for the first two years of my life, we lived on a, in Medford Lakes, New Jersey. We moved to Cherry Hill and that's where I Spent my years and went to high school there and uh, then went to college in New York. And here I am. So <laughs> you said, and here I am. Outside of Philly. <laughs> Go down to shore, you have a glass of water, you get a hoagie. Uh, one of my best friends is ever in Philly. So so you, um, and now you're, you don't live in Philly now, do you? No, no, no. I, oh. I, 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 look. Because I'm in the entertainment world, so naturally, as a Broadway performer, I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> no, I moved to New York when I graduated college. I moved to New York and started working, and and then uh, ended up in LA and would go back and forth between LA and New York. And and then uh, you know we also have a place in Florida, which is uh, where I'm hanging my hat right now. But um, yeah, so that's that's my thing. I, I got so you're out in of, Florida. Yeah, I'm in Florida right now. Yeah. Okay. But I know I know you go back and forth to LA and bounce around here and there. Yeah, pre-COVID, I'm in LA every two weeks. So oh, wow, yeah. yeah. Somebody said Springsteen, Bon Jovi, or Sinatra. Uh, bon Jovi. I like the uh, Bon Jovi, the French <laughs> rock singer. Bon Jovi. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. Uh, there's Waterford. Catherine Franco. She's an actress. I, she was on my show a couple um, couple weeks ago. She's amazing. I like so, that. so okay. Talk about. So you grew up in New Jersey. That yeah. that that explains a lot. <laughs> I get it now. But people from um, Jersey. Yeah. Springsteen, Bon Jovi, or Sinatra. Right. So so. I Jersey, like, I, you know, Jeffrey Gittimer is a good friend of mine. He's from that area. And, yeah. and, and he's like, um, there, there's just this edge that Jersey people have. But I, here's the thing though. North I, Jersey and South Jersey are very, very different. And I really you know, I joke. Oh, very. And you know, North Jersey's New York, South Jersey's like apple orchards and beaches and, and even the beaches, like 
you know, like the North Jersey beaches, they're not the same as the Southern New Jersey beaches. We have Cape May. Cape May is very like New England. You drive around, all the houses are painted in bright pastel colors. It's a very different, uh, it's a very different upbringing. So. Wow. Yeah. So, and that's where you went to school, high school, all that. Yeah. And then you went to college in New York. Where'd you go? I went to Hofstra University, which is a small private university on Long Island. And the reason I did that, like, I didn't have any guidance, right? I wanted to be an actor and and uh, great, my high school mentor, great guy. But it, it's so funny. He he was like, you know, maybe you should think about a different career, right? So, <laughs> what? Yeah. And wow. like, he, and, and later he wrote in the yearbook at the end, he goes, you know what, you know, send me tickets to your first starring role on Broadway. So ironically enough, all those years later, I did. Um, and he's a very, very dear friend to this day. But um, wow. yeah, so I went to I went to Hofstra <laughs> University and um, I got into all these different colleges, but I went to Hofstra because it was closest to New York. And I guy I went to high school with was going. So we were roommates. That's how I ended up at Hofstra. And, and ironically, is, they had is, a giant Shakespeare festival there. So I, I lucked out. Is it, What's Hofstra known for? I've heard of it. Actually. Business. It's a oh. business school, business and law school. And I Wayne swear Corbett. I thought you were going to say auto mechanics. Yeah. No, the Jets uh, The Jets uh, have their practices there. Or they did when I was there. So, And Wayne Corbett came out of there. Um, a couple of good good people came out of there, you know, athletes. Um, wow. But it's mostly um, it's mostly business and, and law. They have a law school. And every this is the other cool thing is every year they do this um, talk where they bring a former president – to speak. So it's really kind of cool to be around that. Wow. Yeah. So you graduated from college? I did. With a degree in business. Yeah. My degree was 98.6. And uh, wow, that was a joke. Uh, No, I I graduated a degree in theater. You know, I had a... a, Oh. Yeah. I didn't. I went for theater. I'm not going to, you know, I learned business later. I, I knew I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. I knew from a very young age. Not, I shouldn't say I knew that I wanted to be in the industry. I knew that I wanted to create. And as a kid, I used to like go in my backyard and pretend that I was in all these other places and escape from, you know, whatever obstacles I was facing, you know, as a kid. And um, it was just something that I felt comfortable. I'd done theater in high school. I also played sports in high school. But it's a place that I just felt comfortable on the stage. And um, it allowed me to disappear a little bit, you know. So that's what I studied disappear on the stage yeah because you don't have to be yourself you're be, you're becoming someone else it's, uh, a, it's an interesting um it, it's a really interesting path because when you when you meet a lot of actors um there's this i shouldn't i'll speak for myself you know sometimes it's going through life is difficult right and it's hard to face challenges so when you can escape and become somebody else or learn about something else, there's a freedom, right? You don't have to face the, you know, like the difficulties in your own life. So, um, so I did that. Where'd you go? I'm here. I'm oh, you giving are. you the stage. So oh, you, you got me the stage. Here. Look at that. <laughs> so, um, there's also a freedom in it because when, when I, when I was a kid, I wanted to do all these different things. I wanted to be an archeologist. I wanted to be a, a, an oceanographer. I wanted to go into space. Wow. And I realized that as an actor, I can become all of those things, learn about them and study them, become them for a certain amount of time and then go on and learn something else. So it, it kind of drew me to the discovery aspect of it. So that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. And and in in college, like my wife, my wife, I didn't go to college. My wife went to college and she was in theater. Yeah. <laughs> At, at in college it's not the same right um what so how do you study how do you d- get it i don't understand that how do you get a degree in theater like you just like take a lot of classes on on how, what is i don't get yeah it. you basically put on clown makeup go on a stage once and they give you a degree no <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my wife didn't go to college either she fast tracked at 15 she moved to new york and Started dancing with Mikhail Baryshnikov in American Ballet Theater. So, um, in many and your ways, wife's amazing, by the way. Oh, thanks. I yeah. think college is overrated for artists, but we can talk about that later. I think it's a waste of time and a waste of money. Um, wow. The uh, yeah, we can talk about that. The way it works is, and and here's here's why we're segueing right into it. It's a lot of theater history. It's a lot of 
studying of theory. It's a lot of like, I can, I can ramble off the history of theater. I can ramble off all these great plays by these great playwrights going back to Sophocles and Aristotle and, and all these, you know, Tennessee Williams. All that does is it gives you an understanding of what your industry is. Yeah. The real part to me. Yeah. Can I, I do you want me to do Jason Statham? You want me to do that one? You want me to do something <laughs> like this? You want me to do Michael Caine? I could do Michael Caine. This in the secret to doing Michael Caine is never to say more than three words at one time. <laughs> yes. I, I can actually do I can do Hugh Grant as well. If you want me to. Um, Wow. The thing about it is to me, it's the doingness, right? It's the doingness of something. You're not going to learn it unless you do it. And so that is why I think um, my whole focus now, it's, I wrote, I wrote a book about it is you, you need to for specifically for artists or for anybody who's learning something, the only way you're going to learn it is if you do it again and again and again and again. So I think that that's it. That's how you get a degree in theater. You know, you work, (laughs) you study, you read books and then you graduate. Hey, Cassie wants you to do the whole thing as you. <laughs> yeah, I could do. Yeah, the entire interview that would the just be awkward to me. I'm just just being honest. I yeah, would I'm be like, stop. Do I'd rather do Jason Statham. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. This is my buddy David Anthony. He's over and he's in the. He lives in the UK. Oh, hey, David. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, so so you're saying that the history of theater. Um, is really about all you pick up. It's, it's- well, you know what? Here's here's the thing, and and this is why I say that college I think is overrated and a waste of time for for artists because I can learn, I can read at any right. point, right? That's all I did was I read and I studied, and you learn to break down. Um, you learn to break down. It's not even breaking down a script for acting. You're breaking down a script for theory. Yeah. Why was this written? What was the political climate of the times? Why did Shakespeare write his plays the way he did? What was he commenting on? Those are things that I can study outside. And so, you know, the average person spends over $200,000 a year. Two, it's about $220,000 a year. Uh, I'm sorry, total. Total. In college. And the average person comes out with thirty to 35000 in debt minimum. And so when I think about artists, you look... I know so many people that have gone to university, unless you're going to university that has a mafia, like a Juilliard or an NYU or a Yale grad program, where you're coming out and you're instantly connected, I think it's a waste of time. And I will even say this, you know, I, there was somebody that graduated from the LMFA program that I knew and quit the business within a year. So I would rather see people take that $220,000 move to the city in which they want to apply their trade as an artist, whether that's New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta now is a hotbed, you know, London, wherever you're going to do it yeah. and spend the money working with the greatest teachers that are available in the world. Yeah. And you're going to be four years ahead of anybody that comes out of university. But, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Maybe it's fortunate. I don't know. You know, you, you, you get these um, government assisted, uh, student loans and and all that bull crap, and I, I think it does such a disservice to our our youth. I mean, you come out of out of college at twenty one, twenty two years old, insignificant debt. Absolutely, <laughs> like, you're behind it's the, the eight dumbest ball. ass thing I've ever heard. You're a hundred percent behind the eight ball. And in my industry, it's not like you can get out and get a job in a law firm or an accounting firm. Right. You get these temp jobs and your day job becomes your life job. And the whole reason I wrote this book, The Utter Survival Guide, was because people are giving up their dreams. They're giving up their dreams because they can't freaking sustain. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's sad. I mean, art to me changes the world. It's the thing when COVID happened, what what were we all doing? We're sitting there clicking television, watching art, you know, art. It's true. So, yeah. It's very true. So, so is there a big difference between... Um, is there a big difference between being on film and being on a stage? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the basic, the basic fundamentals are the same in terms of, you know, acting and and character. Yeah. Uh, Michael Caine did this great thing. It's, it's, it's a thing about acting on film and he breaks down the difference. If I'm going to act on film, you literally, I'd be talking like this and, small. 
because you think about your television or when you go to the movies, when movies are around, um, you know, the, your face is anywhere between, you know, two feet to 25 feet tall. So mm, small yeah. gestures, you know, Anthony Hopkins is, he's a genius. Yeah. And just one look, you know, this look <laughs> means so much. Right. But on stage, you can't see this. Uh, because you're 100 feet away, so you have to do this. Right. So there's a, there's a huge difference in in the in the physical preparedness or the physical part of being on stage versus film, but the bottom line underneath is that you still have to have that character development and you have to communicate, and that's really that's the thing. Did you learn that in college? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no. That's the that's the thing, man. I again, I don't I don't get it. I really don't. Um, but unless you're on, unless you work on film, unless you get on a film now, yeah. here, here's the thing. I mean, there are some film schools, like you go to NYU film school or things like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and some schools do have this, but the only real way to, to really get into it is to do it. You know, I had a college mentor, he's a great guy. His name is Richard Mason. He was Marilyn Monroe's escort during the war, right? When she was doing USO stuff. And he used to he used to say, "Don't think, just do." He used to scream it from the back. Don't think, just do. <laughs> right? Those things, those little gems. But um, again, it comes down to doing this. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so you got out of college, and um, you immediately became the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, within a day. <laughs> He's the youngest guy. Uh, it's funny. My, there's another woman. She was, her name is Miriam Toulin. She passed away. We call her Dr. T PhD. One of the first graduating classes of Yale. And I, I remember, and I, I was, I'm a good, like I love studying. I just, I'm a, I like that aspect of it. And I, I had written some paper or something like that, and I got a C and I was like sitting in the theater and I was like, my head was down and she comes over. She's a very tiny lady and I'm six, four. And she goes, Mr. Baba, what's wrong? And I said, Oh, Dr. T, I got a C on a paper this paper for a comparative lit. And she goes, let me ask you a question. When is it, do you think at your next audition, they'll ask you for your GPA? Oh, I was like, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. So wow. anyway, that, that stood me in good stead, but I got out of college. I moved to New York immediately. And, um, I just started pounding the pavement, man. And, uh, what's uh, doing what looking for job for, yeah. for, for auditions acting or yeah, acting gigs. I didn't have an agent. I didn't come out of, that, that's the other advantage of going to what I call the mafia schools, you know, the, the, the bigger schools like a Juilliard or a Northwestern or an NYU. Is at the end of your senior year, they have auditions for casting directors and, um, and agents. And, you know, some of, the, some of the bigger stars like, you know, Sutton Foster is an amazing performer. You know, she came out of school and, you know, Audrey McDonald, they, they had agents and things like that when they came out of school. Yeah. Um, so you're in an advantage. Um, some didn't, and I did not, I did not have that luxury. I didn't even have auditions. Hofstra didn't offer that. Um, and so I came out and just literally pounded the pavement. I would find where auditions were. I would submit, there were things that I would do in the summers while I was still in school. Um, summer stock, you know, I would go and audition before the school year ended. And I try to get like three shows in a summer somewhere in Kentucky or something like that, just to build a resume. Wow. But that's it. You just go and hit the ground, man. Kentucky. Yep. Prestonburg, Kentucky. They don't, <laughs> they don't turn their bear, that bear them trucks. They <laughs> Google clusters and they work on them pickups at the wind. The pig well, wing. You got a theater gig though. in 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 Kentucky. Oh yeah, man. There's theater all over this country, all over. Prestonburg, really? Kentucky is an outdoor theater called the Jenny Wiley story, which is based on a true story about Jenny Wiley, who was a settler who was captured by the Indians. And, um, Really? Yeah, it's a true story. So it's an outdoor theater. So we every year they did the Jenny Wiley story, which is a story about Jenny Wiley's life. And then they would do three other musicals and uh, legit musicals like Hello, Dolly or Camelot or something like that. You know, there's there's stuff all over the country. There's theater where you are. There's union theater, non-union theater where you are and uh, community theater. This was, this was um, non-union professional theater, meaning I got paid, but I wasn't yet in the union. So, union being 
The Union for Stage Actors is Actors Equity Association and okay. for Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA, they're combined at SAG AFTRA for television, film, and radio. Okay. They're and the unions that govern the actors. You're in both. I'm in both. Yeah. So you've uh, so so after leaving Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, so I, all right, dude. There was a copperhead crawled across the stage one night. <laughs> no way. Yeah, the old adage. <laughs> is for, the old adage is when you're doing outdoor theater, they would say, uh, "How do you know a good actor? If a bug, if you're in the middle of a scene and a bug flies in your mouth, do you spit it out or swallow it and keep on going? <laughs> the real actor swallows it and keeps on going. <laughs> I mean, the electric a raccoon." I think a raccoon oh got in the electric grid, short circuit, everything. I mean, oh my god, wow! Great so, story. so you, so you were in, but your base was New York, yeah, and, and um, which I've only, you know, I I don't know if you know, I've only been to New York once in my entire life. I've flown into the airports for you know right. layovers, but but I've I've only been in Manhattan like one time in my entire life. And it was mind blowing for me. Yeah. And I thought the entire time, I thought, and this was just a few years ago, I thought I was going to be mugged. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely getting mugged, so I can't carry a lot of cash. No, and, it's a great city, and, man. It's, oh it's, my god, it's amazing! Somewhere. It's amazing. So, yeah. So, so, so your base was in New York. At what point did you think, well, there's got to be theater opportunities in L.A. Well, that was a ways down. So oh. the, tra the trajectory was you basically try to get a job wherever you can get a job. Yeah. And it, it's to build the resume. And then the goal would be to get back to New York because, you know, it. if you want to be in television and film, you have to be in the place where television film is shot. If you want to be on Broadway, which is what my goal was at the time, you have to be where Broadway is. I'm not going to be on Broadway being in Idaho as much as I think Idaho is a great state. It just doesn't exist. You know, Broadway doesn't sit there. Right. So- the, the goal was always to build and build and build and build and to follow a path. And right. the way you do that is to build up credibility and being, you know, being known for what you do and auditioning. And look, I, I used to stand and I used to get to Actors Equity Association. There's where they used to hold auditions. They still do, but in other places now. I used to stand in line at seven o'clock in the morning for an audition that would be one o'clock in the afternoon because the doors to the building open at nine and you got to sign up and it's 28 degrees outside. Wow. And I tell this story one specific time I got there and there are already like 75 people ahead of me at seven o'clock in the morning, 28 degrees. And you're freezing your wow. you know, butt off. And there's a little McDonald's right there. So we used to go in, have somebody, you know, watch my place in line. You switch. I'd go in and get some tea, come out. They'd go in. And I used to see people show up at like eight o'clock thinking, oh, I'm going to get there. And now there's 150 people in line. They look at the line and like, and they go home. They're out of the game before they wow. even start playing. So that's the wow. pounding pavement. That's the, you know, that's the, that's the paying your dues. And, and so eventually what ended up happening was I auditioned, auditioned, auditioned. I started building up my resume. I did a show at Mill Mountain Theater. I did Camelot at Mill Mountain Theater. Now, remind you, I'm an actor. I studied Shakespeare. I didn't do uh, it. I did one musical in college or two. Um, and and it, singing wasn't the thing. Like, I didn't start really studying until much later. Wow. Um, but I, I grew up around music, so I just did it. And then yeah. uh, I got this Camelot at Mill Mountain Theater. And uh, from there, uh, I auditioned for the national tour of a Broadway show called The Secret Garden. And I have a penchant for doing voices or sounding like things. And Mandy Patinkin, the great actor Mandy Patinkin, was starring in The Secret Garden. And I had a beard. It was dark yep. at the time. Um, and I walked in and Mandy had a beard in the show. And, and, uh, there's a song he says, um, uh, from his, uh, from all these albums he used to do, but Mandy has a very unique voice. And so I sang a song called I hear bells and I went in and I would go in and out of a Mandy impersonation. So I do, I hear bells in the summer night, distant bells that no one hears. I hear moonlight softly chiming. And Mandy has that weird tenor and the thing <laughs> of Ivy climbing. And I could see the director going, <laughs> and I got called back. I got called back to sing for his role, but I was wow. really super young. And I ended up getting that show in the ensemble, but understudying the other male lead. And that was my first big national tour of a Broadway show. It was 1992.
Now, okay, so what when you say national tour, what's yeah. what's that so mean? Tour. Like you went all over the nation and yeah. Took- so, like, wh- there, what's the big theater in Ohio? I mean, there's a ton of them, right? There's the Ohio Theater. Yeah. So Broadway shows coming through there: Lion King, Hamilton, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a national tour. Okay. So you know, Phantom comes through. Here, here's the thing about Broadway shows on Broadway don't make money. They make money when they go on the road mm. because they have a captured audience. The cost of running in New York is so expensive. The goal is to get the show enough credibility that it can go out on the road, go to Canada, go to South America, go to Europe. And that's where the money's made. And so wow. I did a national tour and I toured for a year and a half on that wow. show. And then I left that because I got my first Broadway show on Broadway, which was Cyrano. So, which was what? Cyrano, the Bergerac. It's a musical okay. version of Cyrano. So you, when you say I got a show on Broadway, that means you don't tour. You stay on Broadway. Stay on Broadway. Yeah. You okay. you sit. You live in your home in New York, and you go to work at a theater in Midtown on Broadway. Wow. Green. Dude, when when Joe, do you know who Joe Soto is? Help me. He's dude. You want to know Joe Soto? He is the. He made he. He 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 did all of it, uh, Ty Lopez's stuff in the beginning and and made made Ty like forty. I'm in, I'm in 40. my garage. I'm my Lambo. I'm in my garage. <laughs> Joe, come film me. Joe is a badass. I, he's in. I'm in a a mastermind group with him and Jeffrey Gittimer, Man, he's oh he, nice. He's incredible. You, you want to know him? I, I'll introduce you guys. Yeah, that'd be great. But but so. Um, so okay, so you 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 ended up with your your first show on Broadway. How yeah. long does that last typically? What's well, that's the rub, right? Uh, a show like I did a Tale of Two Cities in two thousand eight. It was a sixteen point five million dollar production that lasted for six weeks. Wow! Their shows that open and close. We lasted. Um, oh, awesome, Joe. We lasted. I can't remember how long Cyrano lasted. About six months. Um, okay. And then it closed. And then I I went on to do an off Broadway show. Um, and then from that off Broadway show, there was a little interesting thing that happened. And then I ended up with my first, um, starring role. I ended up understudying Billy Bigelow and Carousel. And I took over that lead. That was a multiple, multiple Tony award winning show. It's where I met my wife to be, um, incredible show, Rogers and Hammerstein show. And that's where I got to dig in with the acting chops that I learned. And then from there, I went to Beauty and the Beast. I went to Los Angeles to play, I was supposed to do the national tour of Beauty and the Beast as the Beast, and I went to L.A. with the Broadway cast to understudy and learn the role. And then Terry Mann, the great Terry Mann, who played the Beast on Broadway, left after a couple months, and I ended up staying in L.A. And I sat down in L.A. for two and a half years, and uh, that's when I ended up buying my house and did Beauty and the Beast. And then that finished after two and a half years. Then a year and a half year, about a year later, I went back to Broadway with Beauty and the Beast with Tony Braxton. Um, who's awesome. I adore Tony Braxtoni. I love you. Um, she left. Andrew McCardle came in. Uh, and then I got Jane Eyre. I got the title role in the, not the title, I didn't play Jane Eyre. I got Rochester <laughs> in Jane Eyre. We went to La Jolla, mm-hmm. did an out-of-town tryout about a year and a half. Now, here's this. We did an out-of-town tryout of a Broadway show, but we didn't get to Broadway until almost a year and a half, almost two years later. Wow. So, did that and that's it just built and that was my first original role i originated that role on broadway and that's yeah. just how it is you just keep going you know uh, were there were there times along the way and I, I this is kind of a rhetorical question um but were there times where you were like we can't eat <laughs> like yeah. or or like uh, man, I think they're going to shut the electric off tomorrow. <laughs> like, were there times, and I, maybe not that extreme, but were there times Whoa. where it was like, shit, man, we can't, how are we going to make it? Yeah. Well, at that point, it was just me, right? I wasn't, mm, uh, yeah. you know, I, I wasn't married, didn't have kids. Um, but there are lean times for sure, man. I mean, you have to think about, my, my focus was so singular in terms of, this career that I, I would do things to, to make sure that I would get to where I wanted to go. Um, you know, my parents were supportive, but by, they by no means were going to like, Hey, I'm going to buy you an apartment. I'm going to buy you this. I'm going to buy you that. 
Um, you know, I had I had two non theater working jobs, um, but I was fortunate. I was fortunate to make a living, um, you know, as an actor. Um, but I remember there was one time I tell this story. I was, you know, didn't have a lot of money. I got a Macy's charge card um, that I had, and, <laughs> yeah. and um, I went down to Macy's Cellar on Thirty Fourth Street, and I got six sticky buns. And you know, I lived on that for a couple of days. Um, but you know, it was it's all about pasta, uh, peanut butter and jelly on a spoon. I mean, literally, dude. I mean, you look in the fridge and you're like, man, you know, here we go. Here's here's a statistic. You remember I, I mentioned Actors Equity Association? Yeah. Um, and Actors Equity Association pushed puts out this. Um, uh, they put out this uh, um, thing every year that talks about the. Um, the uh, how much money an actor makes, right? right? Right. And when I looked at that, I was like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" Because when I when I saw the when I saw the statistics of it, I think it's I think it's eighty nine percent or no seventy nine percent of all members of Actors Equity make fifty thousand dollars a year or less before taxes. Sixty nine percent. Well, dude, you can live actors. like a king on that in New York. Yeah, oh yeah, thirty six G's. But here's the, here's the other stat: sixty nine percent can fifteen thousand dollars a year or less. And these are the top of the top. These are the professional actors. So it's a tough thing. But yeah, I mean there were lean times, but you know I just kept going. So so you said I just kept going, but was there ever a time where you were like, I, I got this is I'm living. I used to, when I was a kid, um, there was a terrible influence in my life. I won't go into that, but there was somebody that was like, get your head out of the clouds. You live in a pipeline dream. Where did you ever think like, what am I doing? I'm not making it. Like I gotta, I gotta, you know, it's, I call it the starving artist syndrome. And the, the first part of my book starts with you'll fail. You'll never make it, get a real job. Yeah. Uh, I, I had people say, like, what do you do for Ling? I'm an actor. Like, oh, yeah? What restaurant do you work at? I'm like, no, I'm an actor. No, no, really. What restaurant do you work at? I'm like, I don't. I'm an actor. And it, it, it would take them aback, you know, early on. But it's also a mindset. You know, the negative influences in our lives can be incredibly powerful. And it's really important to decide who you want around you. Yeah. Um, I was sharing this. I was talking with, with another actor about this. When I first got to New York, like I don't drink, I don't smoke. I never did drugs. Um, but there's a thing in the industry where, or just in life, when you're coming into life and you look at something you're like, Oh, that's weird. I don't know if I want to do that. You know, the, the, how, how, how the group masses work. And so you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But then those abnormal situations become normal. Mm. and you're living in a situation that you would not necessarily live in. And as you start listening to people, oh, you should do this. You should go here. You should do this. So, yeah, I mean, those influences come all the time. And I second guess there was a point where I, I remember it was after I'd already starred in Jane. It was starring in Jane Eyre on Broadway. And at the end of that, I'm like, I'm going to Thailand. I'm going to give up everything. I'm shaving my head. I'm going to put on some ochre robes and I'm going to become a monk. Not kidding <laughs> I mean, absolutely 100% valid. And Why a monk? Well, because I was always I'm very spiritual. I've always been self-searching. I, I, yeah. At that point, I was doing a ton of yoga. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I felt that there was much more to life than just this, you know, this physical iPhone. I need an iPhone. I need iPhones didn't exist then. Right. I need to have stuff. And I felt that there was something more to it. Um, and I felt that there was something missing. And I, I remember I was, I turned on 98th street to walk downtown on Broadway. And I said, am I running to find something or am I running away from something? And I couldn't answer the question. And I said, if I can't answer the question, I'd better not go. And wow. so I didn't go. And, um, I just kept pushing on. Am I running to find something or am I running away from something? Yeah. Wow. You sure that was you that asked you that question? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Wow, dude, that's deep. That's deep. And how old were you at that point? I was 34, 34, 35. 
That's that's a fairly deep question to ask oneself at 34 years old. Yeah, I so, I don't know. I was stra- I started asking you those questions in my teens. I remember I have journal entries where I would talk about spirituality and and you know, wow. What is life and what what is beyond? Why are we here? You know, all those things. That's pretty incredible, dude. So so you um you you ended up in LA. I think you said you had you had bought a house and you were I doing did. beauty beauty and the beast. Yeah. And how long you said two and a half years you did Beauty and the Beast? Well, I did it on Broadway for uh, uh sorry, LA for like two, two and a half years, and I did it in New York for about um I don't know, like a year, a year and a half, maybe. Yeah. Um what I kept getting pulled to LA because I I wanted to do film and um and I saw you know, the segue, and it's funny, it may have in, in, in some ways, uh, taken me off my path because, you know, you, you should never, it's one thing you should never, um, leave your main mode of income. And my main mode of income was being on Broadway and being a stage performer. And so, you know, I, I would leave that because I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm at this level. I would leave that and go to LA. And I, you know, I, I did well, I got, you know, I, I, you know, I, I ran into some cool stuff. Um, but I always, again, I, I was a creator, right? I wanted to create my own stuff. I didn't want to be a cog in a wheel. Yeah. Um, and I looked at doing theater and, and that getting to a certain level as a, as a, as a way to create influence so that I could leverage that to go other places. Um, but I would go back and forth. I did, you know, LA. Uh, then I did, um, you're in town on Broadway, which is a hilarious musical. I did the original reading of that and then, um, was doing Jane Eyre and then went back, did it on Broadway, did assassins in 2004. We got multiple Tony nominations and awards and that's Stephen Sondheim and uh, uh, incredible cast, Neil Patrick Harris. I mean, great wow. people. Then, um, uh, a tale of two cities and then, um, then phantom, which was like, I was a three-year run. I remember the when I was in New York that one day. I think mm-hmm. I even, I think we were texting. I don't remember. I think I, I thought I texted you like, "Dude, I'm in New York." <laughs> like I was literally around the corner from you. And oh, really? I think, I think you were in the middle of of doing a show or something. And My bad. Um, but uh, that's something that I always wanted to come and see you do. And then I think it was literally a few months later, I believe that you were like, yeah, uh, we're moving to Florida and, and all that. So um, what's, so, so talk about what, first I want to talk about your book. You've got, yeah. you, you just have one book, right? Or is there more than one? Yeah. Well, it started out, uh, it started out when I was in Phantom. Actually what happened was, is that, you know, I started Grant Cardone's a friend and great yeah. inspiration to so many people. And he and Elena came to see the show and, and we were talking, he's like, what are you doing, man? And I'm like, man, it's good. You know, I didn't fall asleep. You know, he didn't, he didn't, say <laughs> it. but you know, he didn't say that, but, uh, they had a good time. And, um, and then I went to, he was at NASDAQ and I went over to hang with him at NASDAQ when, when 10 X rule came out and that little millionaire booklet came out yep. and he gave me one. And I looked at that. And, you know, he breaks down how to make a million bucks. And I quoted yeah. in my book, he let me quote it. And, you know, I was like 5,000 people paying you, what is it, 70 bucks a month, a million dollars. I'm like, hmm, it's interesting. And I know so many performers and artists who are not surviving because of the financial aspects of this. Yeah. So I wrote, I started writing this book called The Thriving Artist. It said starving artist. And then starving was crossed out. It said thriving artist. And I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. And then... Um, you know, I got inundated with with Phantom and then Phantom, my run and Phantom coming to an end. It was a long and amazing run. Great right. people there. And um, and then I just got into production. I started working with another buddy of mine named Ted McGrath, who's an amazing online marketer and an entrepreneur. And uh, he wrote a play and I produced that play. I directed it. He starred in it. We're now making a huge feature and, and of, of that play. And then I just got rolling and then COVID hit. And I saw all of my artist friends out of work instantly. I mean, normally the industry is like, oh, these 10 people are out of work and then this person's out of work and it dovetails. That's not what happened. Everybody's out of work 
all at the same time, 100% at the same time. Yeah, it was like a, a rock falling off a table. Yeah, boom. Yeah. And so, and there was no foreseeable return. And it became about my unemployment. How am I going to get my unemployment? Then it became about, well, the unemployment run out. Am I going to get government subsidy? And mm. I'm sitting there going, guys, you got, it's going to run out. And that's when I started writing the book for real. And I called it The Artist Survival Guide, What They Never Taught You in School. Mm. And it's not about acting and singing and dancing. It's taking all the techniques and lessons that I've learned from Grant and being on the stage at ClickFunnels and, you know, with Russell and those guys and hanging out with Ted and stuff I've learned from you and stuff that I've implemented in my own life and career in the business side, the marketing side. And I the effort is to truly show artists and anyone that they can create a residual stream of income based on their own skill set. They could right now create something with their art that could generate income for them, even when they're back to work, even when they're back, you know, film and television sort of back. But when live performance is back, you'll still be able to generate this. It's this residual income. And wow. so um, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, there's one chapter called The Artistpreneur, which literally says, look, you're an, an artist is an entrepreneur. Right. And, and so that's what I did. And you can get a free chapter if you want to grab a free chapter at jamesbarber.com slash ASG. Somebody yeah. put that in the comments for me, would you? Jamesbarber.com forward slash ASG. Um, it, uh, it won't it won't take in all all, all places. Um, oh. All there, there. You're, you yeah. gave it to me in private and I'll oh. put it up. Yeah. Oh, cool. I'll put in all the comments. Perfect. And then somebody else can add it as well for, for us as, as well. So, um, so, so when now is this book out yet? Um, it is on okay. Amazon. Um, it just came out yesterday, but we're going to do a big push. Um, so you can grab it on. It's only 99 cents. Whoa. I know. Really? Right now. I know. We're oh, going to do a big God. push. I want to do a big push for it um, uh, later. Oh, here it is. I found it. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to drop that link in as well so people can go pick it up. Now, it says it's fourteen ninety five. the paperback. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it might the digital version. That's why. I don't That's see why. it. Digital I'll tell version. you, just have them go to that website and then okay. they'll get a free chapter and then I'll send them the links to the 99 cent version. Perfect. Perfect. So my wife put it in. My wife's a huge fan of yours as well. Hello. Um, so the next time you're on Broadway, do you think there's ever going to be a Broadway again? Yeah, I do. Do you? Uh, I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's a cheap Canadian. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a line for from a TV show uh, from a movie. Oh, is it? <laughs> I'll buy that for a dollar. Oh, I don't know if he's quoting that. Um, Broadway. So here's the deal. Um, you know, Cuomo posted something yesterday that said he can't keep the city closed down um, anymore, and he's got you know that. the economy's you know killing killing the city and people are leaving. Um, I, which I, I'm like. That was a genius statement, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, people have been saying, look, people have been saying it in different cities for a long time, and just everybody's going to have their own reality on stuff, and, right, and right. it is what it is. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, like anyway, the the thing is, is that even at social distancing, um, if theater comes back and it's at thirty or fifty percent, you know, even at like if you do the numbers for Phantom. At thirty percent with social distancing, you're looking. It's a sixteen hundred seat theater, right? So at thirty percent, you're looking at four hundred and eighty seats a show. Yeah. And the average ticket price for Phantom is eighty nine dollars right now, or was when it when it closed. There are higher seats and lower seats. So that's forty two thousand dollars a night times eight shows is three hundred and forty one thousand dollars, which won't cover the cost of most of these shows running a week. Right. So. It needs to get to a point where it's back up at a at a decent rate. Yeah. You know, Hamilton's selling it upwards of a grand a ticket. You know, uh, jeez. 
So, I mean, they're going to be okay. Some of the bigger shows are going to be okay. I think Phantom will be okay. I've been telling people to focus on creating one person entities, one person shows, because if you're working in a 200 seat theater and you're selling at 30%, it's just, it literally is a numbers game, guys. It's, it's business. Yeah. It's, it's a total business. 200 seats is six at 30% is 60 seats. Uh, average ticket price, $65. That's 3,900 times eight. That's 31 grand a week. Even if your costs are $10,000 for a one person show, you're still coming out with $21,000 in positive cash flow a week. So yeah. I think keeping it lean um, and um, uh, lean and mean is the way to go. But I do think it'll come back. I, I, there's there's no um, there's no uh, there's no other way to do it. Look 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 who's watching what he just said. Hello, Glenn. <laughs> How are you? Uh, so so with the. Um, I mean, talk a, talk a little bit about what you're doing with the thriving artist um, deal that you've got going. Because I, I know it's more than just putting out a book. And I mean, yeah. And, and I have a I have a um, a question that I, I think you can address, and that is, I there is this overarching thing among artists. Um, I've always considered, I'm, you know, I do graphic arts and I'm, I'm a musician and, um, but like there's this thing where artists have a tendency of falling into these deep, dark places, depression. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and, dude, and I was going to, I was going to get t-shirt. I was going to call my company DBG Inc. Dark brooding guy Inc. <laughs> Cause it's all I play, right? The dark. dark right. Brooding. Dude, I'm wearing black, man. I know. <laughs> what? What? Why do you think, though, that that is common among artists? That this depression thing. You know, again, it, it depends upon the person. When I when I see people in the arts and entertainment world, I think there's. And I'm not saying this for everybody. I think people enter into it again. Remember, I talked about escaping early on. Yeah. They're using the arts to escape. They're using the arts to fulfill something within them. Um, artists have a tendency to be very um, emotional. They wear their, you know, they wear their emotions on their sleeve. Um, yeah, I do think that artists change the world. I really do. I think art heals the world. But what comes with that, the facility to be open and have your emotions on the sleeve, which is what makes great actors great. They can just access their emotions that way also makes them very vulnerable. <clears throat> you know, I remember being on the subway after Jane Eyre. I got mixed reviews on that show on Broadway. And mm. there was some dude with the New York Times and my hair was down to here. I had mutton chops and he's reading the review and he goes like, I'm sitting across him on the subway and you couldn't see me, right? So he goes like this. <laughs> and I was like, oh crap, you know? <laughs> So I think that there's, it's also, here. here's something. It's also the only profession where you can legally discriminate. I'm sorry, you're black, you can't have the job. I'm sorry, you're white, you can't have the job. I'm sorry, you're too heavy, you're too skinny, you're too tall, you're too short. I'm sorry, you're a woman, you can't have the job. Mm. Why? Because it's a, it's a show about Muhammad Ali. <laughs> right, right. And it's an unfortunate thing. And there's also an unspoken arbitrary where it's, it's based on opinion. In, in the book, I talk about uh, a, a great reviewer who be, a, a reviewer who became a great friend later after he retired. And we were having dinner one night and I said to him, why is it that reviewers don't say, or you don't say, in my opinion, this show is this way. Why don't you say, uh, you have to say this show is this way. And he goes, we can't say in my opinion. I'm like, but if you say in my opinion, then you leave it up to the audience member to make up their own mind. He goes, we can't do that. And I said, wow. why not? And he said, because the audience isn't smart enough to make up their own minds. Oh, wow. I quote you. And my jaw dropped to the floor and he just looked at me and he goes, James, it's true. And so wow. Pete Sampras, you know, the Williams sisters, any given day you put them on a tennis court, they're going to whoop the person across them. If they don't, it's because they were not as good as the person on the other side. The other person beat them because of their skill set. Right. It's not the same way. Like some people on here might love Gaga's music. Some people may hate it. 
So there's an arbitrary. And sometimes that arbitrary can become dangerous because it's like, mm, oh, we're just not going your, your direction. And what they're saying is you're too overweight or you're not good enough or my cousin's going to play the role. Right. And so when you have an industry that's built around that, unfortunately, um, it can breed insecurity because you don't know. There's no, um, there's no stability. And when yeah. you're constantly told no, 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 on a continual basis, I think actors would make the greatest salespeople. Those that sustain because they're constantly faced with rejection on a daily basis. Yep. Um, over time, that can wear someone down. Um, and especially when you're dealing with, I'm not selling an iPhone. You're not saying no to an iPhone. They're saying right. no to me and my ability, right? That I think yeah. might be one of the answers. Long, wow. long-winded answer. No, that's a great answer, man. I, actually, Glenn has talked about the, you know, he, I, he, one night he said, I guarantee everybody in this room, I have had more job interviews than all of you combined. <laughs> you know, nice one, man. yeah. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's true though. But <clears throat> so what do you think when it comes to stage, stage acting, what's, what do you think the percentage is? Um, that actually, what's the word? I don't know if make it is the word, but the percentage of people that stay with it. Well, you know, there's this thing called a 10 year overnight success. Right. Um, and I, I know people who have worked very, very, very long, had great careers and then just stop because, you know, for one reason or another, the industry takes them in another direction. Or, you know, for me, like, the, the number of people that are married and have kids that sustain it, it, it the cost ratio of it is massive. Yeah. I'm looking at this pie chart right now. I pulled it up. Um, there is only 6% of actors equity members that make 50 to a hundred thousand dollars a year. There's only 4% that make between a hundred to 200,000. 1% uh, and above that make 200,000 and up. Jeez. Whereas, you know, most of the people are making under 50 K. So if you're, if you're continuing on, like if you get married and you have kids, unless your spouse has an income that will help sustain you, you can't raise a family on 50 K a year in Manhattan. You can't No. And so you have to make a decision. Um, you know, and look, my wife is an artist. My wife is a dancer, right? Yeah. So, um, and ironically enough, I mean, at a certain point, she had had more money saved than I did because I was, you know, I was this dude in New York, you know, yeah, uh, making money and buying stuff. And I, I think the attrition rate is really high. Yeah, um, you know, there aren't many guys that are my age that are still doing what we do. And then there are guys that come in and that take over where we were. You know, it's like you. You move into different roles. I mean, look at Glenn. I mean, he's an icon. You know, he's been here in this industry for so long. And his 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 growth as an actor in different roles, you can see that trajectory. I'm not yeah. going to play, probably not going to play Lancelot and Cam Camelot anymore, right? It's going to go to some 25-year-old guy. Um, but I can play Arthur, right? And so you have to grow into those roles. But I think the attrition rate is, is high. I'm putting your um, website and it's ASG, right? Yeah, Artist Survival Guide. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that up to scroll across the bottom here, um, so everybody can go over to that and and get a free chapter, and um, then you're gonna send them the information to um, to you get the book. To, yeah, you asked about that, so I, I created a group called the Thriving Artist Group. Yeah, yeah, but, that's what I want to talk about. Yeah. And so um, the goal for me was to create something that allowed artists to sustain and allow artists to grow and have residual income within their lives so that they can actually achieve their goal. And even there are people out there that, that have that hidden artist within them. I know how many doctors, lawyers, accountants, teachers who are like, oh, I've always wanted to sing. You know, I sang at church or I play guitar or I play piano or I paint or I, you know, I make these great, you know, photographs but I've never been able to monetize it. And I, I've never been able to like break out. 
Well, this book and my whole goal behind it is to allow art out, is to allow you to say, listen, I can go out and make a go of my art because I truly believe, I was talking to Glenn about this on Clubhouse the other day with Ken, I truly believe that we can, as artists, change the world and make it a better place. So that's what's going to happen. Um, the book is going to lead, I'm going to have an audio version of the book and then I'm going to have courses to set up based upon the chapters in that book. And, uh, and then we're going to do some, you know, there's a Facebook group you can join and all that kind of stuff. Wow. So that's the goal behind it to help people. A question that I forgot to ask you, did you, when you were, well, you don't have to be in LA now cause Glenn lives in Dallas, but yeah. um, have you done any TV roles? Uh, since COVID hit? No period. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A ton. I did the last season of elementary um, that's right. I knew uh, that. That's right. Yeah. 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 And I did, gosh, I've done a ton of stuff, man. I did a movie with, with, uh, Tommy Cavanaugh and, uh, Sarah Chalk. Tom was from Ed. He's on flash now. Um, wow. Elton John, tiny dancer. I did a show with Elton. Um, it's great story about flying with Elton in a jet. That's a crazy story. Um, right, well, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We want to do that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, he, he wrote, uh, there was a musical version of the vampire Lestat. You remember those books? Yeah. By, um, Anne Rice. And so we did a reading of it. Bernie Taupin did the music and Elton, I mean, Bernie did the lyrics and Elton did the music. And, uh, he was playing in Atlantic city and we got invited. A couple of us got invited to go see him in concert. And we ended up, there's like three of us that just went with him. So it was wow. pretty he said to me, he goes, James, you know Glynis Barber, the actress in London with the same last name. I'm like, well, I know who she is, but I don't know. You should be called Glynis. Like, <laughs> okay. But um, great guy. I mean, we talk about an amazing human being. Yeah. Wow. I mean, unbelievable human being, unbelievable artist, an unbelievably caring man, you know, and um, funny. Yeah. Funny as all get out. <clears throat> You know, I've, I've, <clears throat> I've had the privilege of meeting you. I, it was crazy. You and I ran into each other in the Vegas airport, <laughs> right? Isn't that nuts? Like I'm, I look over. I was helping. Like, That's the other thing I do because I've been on stage. I've been in front of over 200 million people live. Right. Wow. And so I help people f communicate and help them with stage presence and being afraid to speak and being able to talk on camera all that kind of stuff. And so I was there w working with somebody who had brought me in to, uh, to help them uh, with that aspect of their business. So yeah, and I was leaving and you were sitting right there. We were sitting yeah. outside the Starbucks. And that yeah. Well, you were in line. I'm like yelling across the airport, James! <laughs> You're like going, oh, <laughs> my name. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, so, so dude, what, so the, the thriving artists and you said you created a group, is that a, a like Facebook group or what, what, what is that? Yeah. So there's, there's a couple. So my, all of my social media is at James Barber now, N O W like right now and yeah. clubhouse. I'm on clubhouse for that. Um, so you can find my Facebook page there and there are a couple of groups. There's one that was called thrive arts that we now call thrive in life that you can join. Um, the Thriving Artist Group is a, is a private group for those that came into my program that I launched okay. um, during COVID. And that's going to be what's going to be opened up uh, once the programs are, are launched for, um, for uh, um, Cassie's in it. Cassie yeah. in it. Um, and uh, you've helped her a lot. She, she's, I, I know that Incredible she, voice, Cassie. Great. She's person. incredible. She's, yeah. she's, she's amazing. In fact, she, she did a, um, for, I don't even know how long it was, but she was coaching, um, our daughter, giving her oh, fantastic singing yeah. lessons <laughs> over zoom, but yeah. yeah. Well, and see, that's a perfect example, right? So here's this yeah. amazing performer who is yeah. not in New York, who has this incredible voice, but has the ability to teach other people to do what she does. Yeah, that, that can be a stream of income. Let me know if you want any assistance. It's interesting. Um, I worry about rights issues, quite frankly, because, you know, they're doing Lion King and all this kind of thing. And I don't know that anybody's looked at that. I, what I'm going to do, just so you guys know, on Clubhouse is I have a very, very good friend who's an incredible playwright. So we're going to be doing brand new works. Um, uh. One of the plays was submitted for a Pulitzer. Um, and one of them from the East to West was turned into a f feature film script. So we're going to be doing a reading of one of his pieces, which is going to be an original, which is going to be really awesome. It, it, there's been readings, it's been pitched. So it's, it's not, 
like it hasn't been done. But uh, we are going to do that. So that's a good uh, that's a good thing. Follow me on on Clubhouse, Justin, and, and you'll be able to see when that's happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cassie says I need to look at Clubhouse. Clubhouse yeah. is uh, like it's um, man. I think it's going to change a lot of things. What What do you think about it? I do too. You know what I like about it? Someone I was listening to Grant the other day, and a woman came on. And she goes, "You know, the only reason, the only thing I think Clubhouse needs to do it needs to go visual. They need to have a visual." And I'm like, I think that would be the downfall. What's yeah. cool about Clubhouse is I can be anywhere and be in a conversation with somebody. You can be networking. You can be sharing things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be on the camera. I mean, I remember one down, if you were on, Grant was like, man, I, I just woke up, man. <laughs> He's still laying in bed, you know. But knowing Grant, he wouldn't, he'd be on camera even if he was laying in bed. He's like, man, I just woke up, man. <laughs> right. Oh, Uncle G. Um, that's true. Man. That's what I like about Clubhouse. Yeah. I also like the diversity. I mean, uh, the woman that brought me on is a woman named Dee Spencer, who was one of my makeup artists in, yeah. in Phantom. And Dee's African-American. And the diversity of the platform and that the, the African-American community has such a huge hole in there. And it, and it, and it gives a way to, to go, hey, listen, we can share what we want to share. Um, right. I think that it's, it's incredibly powerful. It is, man. I totally agree. I see some, I, you know, I see some great things coming from Clubhouse, and yeah. and, and what's crazy about Clubhouse? Oh, welcome to Clubhouse, Mickey. <laughs> we need to get little ears. Oh, Hi, God. I'm Ken. Hi, I'm Jim. Oh, oh my God! Now I'm gonna have the 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 song stuck in my head. So, so um, but you know, I think what's cool about it is 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 you know, it's. Um, you can be on clubhouse you jump in i'm going to jump in and listen or or chat for a couple minutes and six hours later you're like holy crap six hours just went by like it's insane i, it, yeah, I have a question for you yeah so you know there are all of these masterminds and all of these dialogues and the thing that i sometimes get stuck on is i get in there and i start listening but it takes me away from doing Yes. How do you how do you manage that? Because I get in there, I'm a doer, but I'm also a listener. And then I find it's like, you know, in the old days, it's playing video games and you start to play a video game and six hours pass by. It's like four o'clock in the morning, you know, yeah. and you're at level 200 on Halo. But <laughs> I was like, what did I accomplish today? Right. How do you manage that? I, You know, like yesterday, I didn't get on Clubhouse at all. Um, because I had a lot of doing I needed to be doing. Yeah. And, and, you know, I do, I am able to um, multitask so I can yeah. listen with my AirPod in and, and then, but man, it's, it's tough because you don't. But you, that's you another know. great thing about it being audio only is that yeah. I can be working on something and pop in. Right. Yep. Unless somebody really wants you to participate. Right. And, and then it's like, you have to make a decision and that I it's look, it, it's going to require if you get into clubhouse and you're really going to use it to build your brand or your life in any way, you're going to also have to have discipline and, and have to be able to say no. I get, now I'm getting all these dings and I had to turn off notifications because uh, me too, man. It's insane. Like I couldn't, I like, I got shit to do, man. I can't be <laughs> on clubhouse my whole life. I know. So, <clears throat> James, okay, right. what what last question for you, man? Yeah, I can't believe we've been on here an hour already. I'm both. Uh, I apologize. Thanks for having me on, though, dude. I am beyond grateful that you're here. We need so, to do me, you, and Glenn. I know. Well, join us, man. We do. Uh, we typically, but Glenn is really loving Clubhouse. I I, I like the live video probably more. Yeah. Um, but he he's digging clubhouse a lot. Well, I wonder if there's a way to do both, you know? We've been talking about that. Um we've been talking about that. But I you know, my 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 last question for you is yeah. you know, um and and by the way, the number one answer to this is fear. So I I I suspect you'll you'll do better than that. <laughs> No pressure. I could, but, I could be a lemming and just follow everybody, man. <laughs> but so what do you think the number one thing is that holds people back from financial success and 
experiencing true freedom and joy in life? Well, that's why I wrote the book. I did a YouTube video about a year into Phantom called What If? And you can just go to my YouTube page again. It's James Barber now. But it's the question was, what if you could have everything you've always wanted? And I asked thousands of people this question. And I said, do you have a dream? I surveyed it. Mm. 100% of the people said yes. And then I asked them, have they achieved it? And 99.9% .9 of the people I asked said no, they hadn't achieved it. And then wow. I asked, why not? Why not? And 79, I thought it was going to be finances. 79% of the people said fear. It was some form of fear, some form of doubt or fear. Mm. And it's all the same thing. If you doubt, I, I'm afraid to go forward. So I think there is, for me personally, it's uh, I'm not knowing how to. What I mean by that is, for example, I have this book. I wrote a book. But I need to create a way to get it out. So I had to build a funnel. I'm not, I can sort of build a funnel, but I don't really know how to build a funnel. I'm not proficient at it. Like, and I shouldn't be spending my time doing that. And then I was like, well, how do I do that? So I give up, right? This is in, in theory, theoretically. Yeah. And so when you meet an obstacle and you're in an impasse, I think people just give up rather than trying to find solutions or creative solutions or creating partnerships that can create solutions. So it's surrounding yourself with the right people, um, finding the solutions, then implementing them, because that to me is what the the thing is. Again, it's doubt, right? Yeah. No, I don't know how to do it. Oh, I'll just give up. So uh, I think it's fear. I think it's doubt and fear, and I think there's um there's a there's a need to be stable that we all want and feel. And when that stability is taken away, uh, you don't know where to step next. Um, but I'll tell you this from my experience. Um, you can get over everything. I've been through a lot of things in my life. I would never want anybody to go through what I went through. And you can keep walking each step. The sun will rise tomorrow. Night turns into day. You're in a forest. You keep walking. You eventually come out. And if you just take that one step after another, after another, and keep going, you will eventually get to where you want to go. It may take you a little while. You may detour. You may come out with bruises and scratches and bumps, but you'll come out wiser. You'll come out stronger, and you will have accomplished the thing that you never thought you could have. Wow. That was brilliant, dude. Oh, thanks, man. Brilliant. That's my passion, man. That's what I want to do. I want to help people. You want to change the world, make it a better place. <clears throat> it's what I love about you, man. Well, you too, buddy. All right. Um, listen, don't hang up on me, but I'm going to end the show. I All appreciate right. you. Where can every and everybody can follow you at, at James Barber now. At on, James Barber now on yeah. everything. It's the same everywhere. Is it? Right now. it? Even on Clubhouse, James Barber Clubhouse. now. At James Barber now. Yeah. Love that, dude. That's awesome. Thank you to everybody who's been on here and everyone who shared this out. If you did not share this out, we will publicly shame you at every opportunity that we have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So anyway, I, I, I appreciate everybody being here. James, thank you so much, man. And oh, looking forward welcome, to doing, thank you. doing some great things with you in the future, man. You're, you you're a good dude. So you too, thank, buddy. Thank, thank you guys. Appreciate you. Have an awesome day. Look us up on clubhouse. <laughs> oh, come to clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys later. <laughs> Thanks, James. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye.